all, thank you for inviting me. And like uh, Dr. Klingel said, when I first started here almost three years ago, uh, it was great when she approached me because um, my specialty is uh, void and dysfunction, uh, incontinence in patients with a neurogenic bladder. And the, that particular patient population, they have a very special uh, place on my heart, the patients with neurogenic bladders. And today, we really, it's not my intention to give you like a lecture on urodynamics, but at least having an understanding of the parameters that we look at and the uh, evaluation of what it consists of, especially when you are referring a patient for urodynamics, it's a little bit, it's not an invasive test, but it, it's a little bit invasive in the sense that we do have to put catheter certain parts. So um, patients obviously with a little bit of counseling before and that's what I like to see them in the office before the test. Um, they are more uh, open to, to undergo the test. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the role of your dynamics as a tool to aid in the diagnosis of tetic cord and discuss some of the findings in the setting of tetic cord syndrome. And let's start saying that I do adults. Um, that's uh, uh, my specialty, so some of the, the um, information I'm going to present, and the findings are in the adult population, nearly that like, diagnosed with occult cord. And like Dr. Klinger mentioned before, uh, your urinary and bowel uh, issues are one of the most important components of the symptoms that the patient presents. And what do we look for? So typically the patients present with two types of symptoms. We look at them as storage symptoms, such as frequency, urgency of menstruation incontinence, uh, even pain sometimes. And this happens during the filling phase of the bladder. And then we also look at obstructive symptoms, which are uh, symptoms such as hesitancy, straining to urinate, um, patients that say that they feel like they don't empty their bladders completely. And that happens during the voiding phase of the test. And this is the phase that some of my residents <laughs> made when the first time they see a urodynamic tracing. Why? Because it looks like an EKG of the heart, and that's the best analogy to compare to. And this is the most thorough test that we have in urology to diagnose bladder function. And it's a very interactive test that it composed of many tests that just makes one. We call it multi-channel urodynamics. It evaluates the storage phase, like I said before, the empty and avoiding phase, and also, we use electro patches to, um, to identify for the EMG activity. And also, it's very strongly suggested uh, by the American Neurological Guidelines that we use video fluoroscopy to have to look at the contour of the bladder at the time of the study, especially in patients with neurogenic bladders, or we're suspecting that they have, may have neurogenic bladder. This is a typical setting that we have in the office. This is the share. It can also it can make it flat as well. So the patient's like obviously on wheelchairs, doesn't have the, the mobility, and we have a floral in the office. And this is kind of like how the screen looks like. So we have the, the tracing here, and then we also looking dynamically at the same time that we're doing the test, how the bladder feels, how the bladder reacts, the contour, Sometimes when you have a neurogenic bladder, they can acquire like a Christmas tree appearance and uh, like a cone shape and that all those you can see during the uh, VCUG part. And this is like a typical tracing. Like I mentioned before, you have a catheter that goes inside the bladder, one inside the rectum that will measure abdominal pressures. And the subtraction of that gives you the pressure inside the actual muscle, which I'm going to refer to as the detrusor muscle. And then we have the EMG um, that we measured the volume infused to determine capacity, the flow during the voiding phase, and the voiding volume. And it's divided in two, two phases. Like I mentioned before, filling phase and voiding phase. And what do we look into when we do that? And uh, one of the things, parameters that we look during the filling phase, one is capacity. We also look at leaking. We look at incontinence. We look at stress incontinence and uh, we call that abdominal leak point pressure. So we can see also at uh, what pressures a patient leak, which is important when you're determining um, some type of um, stress incontinence are more characteristic of um, pointing towards a neurogenic bladder than others. 
Then we also look at involuntary detrusor contractions, which are not normal during, during the filling phase. We also look at compliance. Uh, so compliance is just the natural elasticity. The bladder have natural elastic properties. And so we look at the changes in, in volume over, changes in pressure over changes in volume over time during the filling phase. A lot of patients with neurogenic bladder can uh, have decreased compliance findings. And then we look also at the contour. This is kind of how we look at a normal, this looks like a normal bladder, except that this is a leak here, but um, so contour is the fifth aspect that we look during the urodynamics. And then we have the voiding phase, which we look at the true store muscle pressures during urination and the flow of urine. And also very important, we look at the EMG activity to, that is should, supposed to relax um, during uh, micturition phase. And then I'm going to skip this slide first, and then I'm going to make a point here. So that's in a nutshell what we what urodynamics is, and that's what we're looking for. And every time we do urodynamics, it's and that's what I like to meet with the patients before because it's important that you have a formulated question and you know your patient's symptoms, because then you need to kind of have a puzzle and like kind of come with a, a test that you'll know if it's diagnostic or in some cases even non-diagnostic. And I'm going to show a few um, articles, but I have to say that the literature out there for adults, like uh, with newly diagnosed adults with tetracord, it's really very scarce, and this is why it's very outdated. Um, and I'm talking about your dynamic findings. I'm not talking about uh, your neurology <laughs> findings or pain. So I'm talking about actual your dynamic findings. Um, in terms of um, patients, for example, in this test, is, I'm just going to start with one that just talks in general about patients bef before and after correction. And the parameters they look at were pain, patients with um, uh, neurologic findings, and patients with bowel and uh, bladder findings. And those patients, 20 out of them underwent, or the ones that were able to follow up, underwent the tethering. And of those patients, 11 out of 18 patients were improved, uh, to his symptoms subjectively improved in terms of like bladder uh, symptoms and bowel symptoms. And it's interesting because, for example, they said sex stays the same. But sometimes we have to think, for us, staying the same, having similar symptoms of having a urodynamics that stays the same after, does this necessarily mean that your symptoms were unchanged? It may mean stabilization of your symptoms. We have to look at the bladder like a very dynamic organ, and there's a lot of times that we have some neurologic conditions that can progressively affect the bladder and ultimately causing upper tract damage, meaning kidneys. So this is something that we have to take in consideration when we look at the studies. In, um, in another study um, that they look at urodynamic findings in the adults with the tetracord syndrome, and again, these are all patients that have MRI findings, right? Because of cold tetracord back then, it's, that's what we want to do now. We kind of want to have more data to see who can we predict with um, urodynamics uh, usage for um, that uh, predict who, who have uh, a cold tetracord. And in this study, the symptoms were mostly storage or irreditative, like urgency, frequency, urge incontinence, things that happen during the filling phase. Most of the dynamics were positive, especially for hyperreflexia. Nowadays, we call that the trusor overactivity and the trusor sphincter dysynergia. After the tethering, the tethering uh, for stop urodynamics, did show some improvement on those parameters in 29% of the cases and on change in 71. But again, I want to make it, um, I want to make the point that on change in our perspective, especially in the pediatric population, I was talking to Dr. Aguiar, who is our pediatric urologist. Uh, she sees a lot of the spina bifida kids and um, a lot of these patients uh, with EDS, tetracord, and I am the one who follows them as an adult. And we were talking about literature in pediatrics, which um, it's, it is proven that it is accepted that there's a stabilization of their condition. Again, looking at the bladder as a dynamic um, 
organ. Uh, there's just another study um, also from some time ago that this showed of, there was 15 patients, and again, most of them have urinary tract symptoms, urodynamics um, did show uh, a reflexia, which is an apo, uh, hypocontractile muscle, many likely were in retention. Um, again, the trusor activity, some mixed lesions, and uh, normal study, three out of 15 patients. And after the dethagorine, there was uh, five out of 11 that wasn't changed, and four of them that had uh, some improvement. And um, this study, I thought it was very interesting, especially because they evaluated 20, 39 patients and they divided between two groups. One group has secondary thethrine and the other group was occult dysrestivism or occult tetracord, a newly diagnosed in adults. And uh, what they saw is that even though most of them have urinary symptoms, but the preoperative urodynamics uh, compared the findings after surgery postoperatively. And they saw an overall 75% improvement of the patients. However, the patients with occult tetracord did better. 62.5% of them have improvement in urodynamic findings or changes. Um, versus only 30% of the ones who have secondary um, uh, thethrine core. So I thought that was very interesting. So they actually thought it was uh, those patients who are called tetracol will probably even benefit <coughs> more than the other in the role of surgery. So let's just go back. This is just a quick um, uh, abstract that we presented in our Society of Eurodynamics back in March. and. Um, it's probably, it's, it's only 19 patients, but I can tell you right now, we have so many more. Um, and out of 34 patients that we have seen in the span probably of a year that were referred, we took the ones that were surgery uh, confirmed with a cold record, I have to say 18, because we can put an MRI confirmed here one. And of those 18 patients, we did their preoperative urodynamics. So this is patients that are already with a culture call, went to surgery, we look retrospectively, and we look at the urodynamic findings. So the majority of them had the trusor sphincter dyssynergia and the trusor on their, on their activity, meaning a poorly contractile muscle. And I can tell you right now that after all of them that we have to update on this series. I think the majority of, of the ones that will have a positive urodynamics, the most common finding, uh, I think, is the true source fenter dysynergia, which kind of goes along with the pediatric literature. And uh, along those lines, I want to present a case scenario of probably um, one of the uh, first patients that we repeated her urodynamics before I mean, after she, she underwent um, uh, surgery uh, to the call release. She's 41, she presented, uh, she had a history of Chiari and EDS. She presented a classical, classical uh, symptoms of the triad. She had a negative MRI for classical findings of a of the record. Intraoperatively, the film was thickened, tight and taut. She underwent core release. And then I just wanted to show her her preoperative urodynamics before surgery and the one after. So I, I don't pretend you to um, understand the tracing, but I can, um, I'm gonna show you some things that you can see here. So this is her filling phase, voiding phase, and you can see here in her capacity, her bladder capacity is like 700 milliliters, which for a woman, and for everyone, but especially for a woman, that's above average. And you can also see here, this is our urinary flow. You can see that it's long, prolonged, and flat. And then you can see her, the trusor function, which is right here, it's not, so great, just believe me. <laughs> um, so we can say that she, she did have some impaired sensation and she have an impaired contractile bladder. Nowadays we call that the nomenclature change as the trusor under activity. And this is her post up urodynamics. So two things changed here. So her capacity is now 500 mLs, 
meaning likely secondary that her sensation improved. So she have an earlier sensation when she should void. And then you can see her flow here, right? What a difference. So she came back to the office and she said, I can urinate like a normal person. And she has still the occasional hesitancy here and there, but she's emptied her bladder great, she's very grateful, and also her other neurological symptoms improve as well. So we're hoping to be able to have more of this data coming up from repeating uh, your dynamics and compare, and also I, I think um, your dynamics is definitely an objective tool that we can use to predict who, who will definitely will benefit from, from one surgery and, and diagnosis is so difficult. <laughs> Um, it's also standard of care by our guidelines to do your dynamics in, um, in patients that were suspecting neurogenic bladders. And I was just reading an article that was from, I think it came like three years ago from the uh, PD uh, people, and they, they were talking about if there's any pr uh, positive predictive factors in patients with uh, tether core incontinence before and after. And it was interesting, they said um, that the only thing that will have a, be a positive predictor factor will be if they have isolated cutaneous lesions or they were already continent. Well, um, but that, that was to say, they said this really doesn't predict who will get better, but it's an important measure on how to help identify in the workup diagnosis as patients and also it's important just because these patients need to have monitoring of their bladders because someone with a neurogenic bladder can eventually deteriorate their upper tracts, and that's probably the main concern for us urologists. Okay.